Thank you, choir and Christabel. Well done. Thank you for sharing your gifts with us, your church family. Let's pray together. Prepare our hearts, O Lord, to accept your word. Silence in us any voice but your own, so that hearing we may also obey your will. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Our scripture this morning as we continue through the Gospel of John comes from John chapter 4. And I will be reading verses 19 through 24. The woman said to Jesus, Sir, I perceive that you are a prophet. Our fathers worshipped on this mountain, but you say that in Jerusalem is the place where people ought to worship. Jesus said to her, Woman, believe me, the hour is coming when neither on this mountain nor in Jerusalem will you worship the Father. You worship what you do not know. We worship what we know. For salvation is from the Jews. But the hour is coming and is now here when the true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and truth. For the Father is seeking such people to worship him. God is spirit. And those who worship him must worship in spirit and in truth. This is the word of the Lord. The Gospel of John, and really the whole of Scripture, time and again reveals a God on the move. A God who takes the initiative, whether with his people in particular or the entire cosmos in general. Consider even the opening verses of the Bible. In the beginning, the authors of Genesis say, God created the heavens and the earth. Creation was not a self-initiating process. It owes its origin to the initiative and creative love of God. And everything that follows those opening verses, days 1 through 7, begins with the verb of which God, if you're a grammar nerd, is the subject, meaning the one who is acting. God created. God said. God separated. God called, God made, God saw, God blessed. And on the seventh day, God rested. Nothing happens in Genesis or in our life in this moment that is not a response to the prior and proactive activity of God. And John affirms as much in the prologue of his gospel, John 1 verses 1 through 18, which is Filled for those with ears to hear with echoes of that creation account. In the beginning, John, and not Genesis, says, was the Word who was with God and who was God. And to this Word, simultaneously united and yet distinct from God, John likewise attributes several verbs of which he is the subject. All things were made through him. He is the light which shines in the darkness. He came into the world. He gave the right to become children of God to those who believed in his name. And in the summary passage after which we have named this whole series through the Gospel of John, Jesus Christ, the Word, is the subject of two crucial verbs. The Word became flesh and dwelt among us. God moved from the universal to the particular. He moved from the cosmic to the world of space, time, and matter. God on his own accord has taken on flesh. And from now on, we do not have to wonder what it looks like when God is on the move. It looks like Jesus on the move. Revealing the intentions and the character of his heavenly father. Salvation history, then, in congruence with the work of creation itself, is marked and owes its life to the initiative of God in Christ Jesus. 
And in this passage we've just heard a few moments ago, God is once again on the move, active, taking all the initiative. As is often the case, the story has begun with Jesus as the subject of several verbs. He went to Samaria. Nobody made him go. He went. He sat by the well. He initiated and struck up the conversation with this woman. And he disclosed what he knew about her, as we heard last week. But now Jesus and the woman of Samaria have transitioned from a personal conversation into a discussion about right worship, a topic over which the Jews and Samaritans were bitterly divided. Jesus has announced, however, that time need not be wasted on arguments about mountains because in him, in his hour, God is on the move. God, the Father of the Lord Jesus Christ, is, look at verse 23 if you're interested, seeking. The Father is looking, searching, scanning for, as Jesus puts it, a people to worship him. A people whose life is characterized by what we may call right worship. Well, what sort of a people does that look like? What is right worship or better yet what is this right worshiper of which the father seeks you'll notice the father is seeking people and not action and how do we become one well i know what it's like to try to become a person that a university seeks many of you do too you present the best version of yourself to this university or this graduate program. Here are my accolades and my accomplishments. Here is what I contribute to a university culture. Here are my letters of recommendation and my essays detailing my vision for the likes of leadership and education. You want the university to know that should they choose you, they would be choosing a pearl of rare and invaluable price. And the same goes for entering the workforce or a romantic relationship. I want my potential boss or my potential spouse to know without question that they will be blessed to have me. That their life with me is better based on what I bring to the table. You want them to know I'm what you're looking for and you don't need to look any further. And I'm sure if you ask Sarah who's out with Phoebe Joe, she would tell you that that's exactly how she feels. And it's easy to take that kind of meritocratic ideal and apply it to how we understand a life with God isn't it? To think that what Jesus means by the Father is seeking such people is that the Father is accepting applications. And you'd better put your Sunday best on and your best foot forward if you have dreams of entry into that people. So who the Father is looking for then are those who are buttoned up, who live life by the book. They are dignified, respectful, Got lots of common sense, these folks. And they would never give way to things like emotionalism. Not in worship, thank you very much. In fact, when the ne'er-do-wells around them have the audacity to do things like move and clap, the true worshipers make sure to look even more somber so as not to be confused with the others. And you'd better believe they have something to contribute. Maybe some gifting at their disposal which anyone, including God, the Father, the Lord Jesus himself, would be pleased and delighted to have. If the Father is seeking such worshipers, he need not look any further than them. These are the cream of the crop, the model worshiper. But that's not what Jesus means. I know that might come as a surprise. When Jesus says the Father is seeking people, he means that, get this, the Father is, it's a secret, seeking people. 
A new hour has dawned. A new creation has sprung into motion. The spirit of the living God is once again hovering about the earth, searching for a community of worshipers. God is taking all of the initiative in creating a people for himself. And we do not have to theorize about what sort of person he's searching for. We only need look at the ministry of the Lord Jesus. For as Jesus says in John 5, verse 19, just a chapter over from our text today, the Son can do nothing of his accord, but only what he sees the Father doing. For whatever the Father does, that the Son does likewise. Jesus' will and movement is united with his Father. The actions of the Son reveal the action of the Father. Who the Son seeks out is who the Father is seeking out. And who does the Son seek out? What kind of person do you most see in Matthew, Mark, Luke, or John? Just pick one. Jesus approaching. Is it the respectable? The put together with a good head on their shoulders? Or is it fishermen? cripples and tax collectors who were perceived as national traitors. What kind of environments do you see Jesus entering into? This question hits me with a little more weight after this pastor's conference I just attended, and thank you very much for letting me escape to that. One of my favorite parts of that event was a dinner that the seminary hosted for a select group of pastors in, get this, talk about spoiled rotten, the president's suite of Baylor's McLean Stadium. I don't know how you could ever watch football anywhere else from that spot ever again. And it was an occasion that I, at the end of the night, could only describe as, of all things, seductive as I connected with big-time pastors from Metropolitan Baptist Churches mingled with seminary factory, faculty and talked about things like programming and endowments, amounts of money that could feed countries. Now, don't get me wrong. These are faithful men and women. They are devoted to the Lord Jesus Christ and to their families and to their churches. And I love my seminary, too. Grateful to be involved and included in such conversations. So I don't know that I would classify that dinner as wrong. But still, and this is the tension, are those the kind of settings you observe Jesus in? Or was he off elsewhere communing with sinners? Does Jesus prefer the company of the pious Pharisees with proper etiquette or that of the woman of the city? who wasted expensive ointment on the feet of Jesus and broke all the rules of decency and decorum so that she, who had been forgiven much, could express the abundance of love that she held for the Son of God. Would Jesus rather shake hands with the magistrate or join hands with a leper? What I observe, and it's just an observation, as I attend to the life and ministry of Jesus, is that the people he seeks out, the people who seem to embody the kind of worshiper that the Father is looking for, are rarely, if ever, the people who think and live as though the Father would be benefited by finding them. Instead, they are people who Christ characterizes so memorably as the least of these, whose worship springs from the joy of being found by the Father. They are quite like this woman of Samaria who approaches Jesus in timidity only to discover that with him she is seen, known, found, and cleansed. God has sought her. Not a curated version of her, just her. And being found, she enters into life, leaving water jar behind with a newfound joy. And perhaps that, then, is right worship. Maybe the worshiper that the Father seeks, the posture that is holy and acceptable to him, 
is not the one that pretends to be healed, but the one who rejoices at the grace of the physician. But is there a shorthand to describe such worship? I am reminded of Flannery O'Connor's marvelous short story simply titled Revelation, which is based on the last book of the Bible. O'Connor was a Roman Catholic novelist and short story writer who was born in 1925 and died in 1964. And she lived in Georgia her whole life, a good old Southern Catholic. And her works of fiction, and they were mostly fiction if not all fiction, were typically set in the American South of her and my and most of your upbringing. Her stories generally carry Christian undertones and would regularly challenge the prejudices of her time, especially racism. Her writing, just as a fair warning if you go look at her stories after this, often features the use of the N-word. But let me assure you that she was not using that foul, violent, wicked, awful word to further the discrimination but to make a point about the black people that it was weaponized against, quite like how Jesus tells stories about Samaritans. So I tell you that now to say that I am about to recount one of her stories that features the use of that word, and I'm not going to use that word. I'm going to say Negro, which is still really unsettling, but just know when she wrote it, she used the real thing, and it was meant to make a point, and you'll perhaps notice it. See, Revelation is one of my favorite stories that she writes. I think it is my favorite. The main character is a Mrs. Turpin, an insufferable and self-righteous woman as there ever was. She is proud. She is an elitist, constantly boasting to others of her good disposition, good deeds, and a sense of decency. She has low regard for black people and white trash, as she calls them. She looks down on freaks and the mentally ill, again, as she calls them. One evening she laid in her bed and wondered who she would be if she couldn't have been herself. And O'Connor writes, if Jesus had said to her before he made her, there's only two places available for you. You can either be a Negro or white trash. Which one? Mrs. Turpin would have wiggled and squirmed and finally said, all right, make me a Negro then. But don't make me one of those trashy ones. And she would have made her, and he would have made her a neat, clean, respectable Negro woman. Herself, you know, just black. As you can see then from her spiritual reflections, Mrs. Turpin is a God-fearing woman. She's good, church-going folk, masterfully embodying the prayer of the Pharisee, only instead of thanking God that she was not like the extortioners, the unjust, and the adulterers, she thanked God that she was not poor, white trash, or black. One day, however, she finds herself at a doctor's office, surrounded by those people she was so grateful she wasn't. And out of nowhere... A young, acne-faced girl strides across the room, hits Mrs. Turpin with a book, and tries to strangle her. You really ought to read this story. (laughs) Seeing through Mrs. Turpin's facade that she has been putting on since the moment she walked through those doors, this girl tells her to go to, and I'll let you guess where she tells her to go, and calls her an old warthog. This encounter shatters Mrs. Turpin. Her world has collapsed. Her incredibly fragile glass house of an identity has collapsed. And this God that she had fashioned into her own image, this God who she believed was lucky to have her, had seemingly vanished. She goes home that night and stands in her backyard staring at her pig pen. She and her husband, Claude, were farmers. And there, looking into that pig pen, she receives a vision, a revelation, after which the story is named. O'Connor writes, quote, A visionary light settled in her eyes. She saw the streak as a vast swinging bridge extending upward from the earth through the field of living fire. Upon it, 
a vast horde of souls were rumbling toward heaven. There were whole companies of white trash, clean for the first time in their lives, excuse me, and bands of black Negroes in white robes, and battalions of freaks and lunatics shouting and clapping and leaping like frogs. And bringing up the end of the procession was a tribe of people who Mrs. Turpin recognized as at once as those who, like herself and Claude, always had a little of everything and the God-given wit to use it right. She leaned forward to observe them closer. They were marching behind all the others with great dignity, accountable as they had always been for good order and common sense and respectable behavior. They alone were on key. Yet she could see by their shocked and altered faces that even their virtues were being burned away. Now sometimes short stories are like good jokes and if you explain them it ruins it. But allow me to over explain for a moment. Do you see what O'Connor is writing? Bringing up the rear were the well-ordered the sensible and the respectable types, collectively discovering the hard way that their commitment to right and dignified worship, their respectability and their holier-than-thou disposition had come dangerously close to altogether quenching the movement of the Spirit. They had made it, yes, but barely. By contrast, those leading in what can only be called triumphal procession were the least of these. White trash learning that they'd been washed clean by the blood of the Lord Jesus. People of color clothed with robes of honor and delighted to be in the front of the line instead of the back. Keep in mind when she wrote this. A testament to the last becoming first reality of the kingdom of God. And lunatics who had been pleased pieced back together by the Holy Spirit, whose new creation wholeness spills over into undignified leaping and clapping. They were leading the charge. They were out in front. They were the true worshipers. Now, how can we characterize such people? What, what language do we have to describe what we're seeing and hearing? Jesus characterized it simply enough. He calls it spirit and truth. This is worship in spirit and in truth. Brothers and sisters, the hour is coming and is now here when the true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and truth, for the Father is seeking such people to worship him.